Hello, this is Mose Jacobs uh, in West Cork, which is quite relevant. And I'm speaking to someone else in West Cork, Fred Kahlo. Hello, Fred. How are you? Hello, Mose. <laughs> Thanks. How are you? I'm fine. And um, can you tell me where you are? I'm in my house on Cool Mountain, which okay. is north of Dunmanway, West Cork. Okay. And um, the reason I'm talking to you is that you're about to publish a book. I think it is your first book. It is, yeah. yeah. And it it, it's called Blow in Living Off Grid in West Cork. Am I saying that rightly? That's right, yes. <laughs> you have to look. <laughs> and um, um, it, it really interested me because the you know, because you, you described very clearly how you moved to West Cork from the Isle of Man. So how would we call you as a, as a resident of Man? How the, how, Manx? Or? I'm a Manxman. Yeah, Manx. Okay, a Manxman. Because right. there's a, there's a, there are cuts without tails called Manx. Oh, there's a lot more than that. <laughs> but are, are they actually on the island as well? Do you have there, to? there are indeed. It's also the first place on the world that allowed women to vote. It's really? also the oldest continuous parliament in the world. Really? It's uh, it's quite a an interesting place for lots of reasons. Yeah. And when when did when were women allowed to vote for the first time? Uh, I think it was about eighteen eighty four. I'm not quite sure. Oh, yeah. It was before New Zealand. Most people claim New Zealand has that honour. That we beat them. Of course, it wasn't all women. It was just those who had lots of money. But uh, you have to start <laughs> somewhere. Wow! And is is it in general? I mean, I I don't I know nothing about the place, but apart from the cuts, and there is a a, a car rally, I think. Uh, a famous motorcycle race. Uh, yeah. Oh, it's a motorcycle. See, okay. Um, but. I mean, is it is as a place because is it is it more Celtic than the rest of England because it it's it belongs to the UK, doesn't it? Belongs it's, in it the UK. Doesn't. It was never in the UK. It was no. never in Europe. It is actually an independent country. Um, really? What can I say about it for you? Um, <laughs> I I really I really assumed it was part of the UK. No, many people do. Technically, it's not. Um, the head of state of the Isle of Man has a second job. Uh, she's also the Queen of England. But uh, who's in the Commonwealth? Two jobs, the same person. It is in the Commonwealth, yeah. Okay. It's officially a Crown Protectorate, I think. Or a is Crown it, is Dependent. It, is it, so it has the same status as Canada and Australia? And... No, it has the same status as places like Jersey. Oh, okay. In the okay. And 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 anyway, not... I, I live in West Cork now. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but that, I still find it interesting because, I mean, I assumed you were an Englishman moving into Ireland, but you're not. <laughs> you're no, I'm not no, I'm Manx. We're yeah. very proud of our heritage, and yeah. um, in many ways, it's similar to West Cork. It's the mixture of Viking and Celt. And people have earned their money from farming, fishing, and tourism for the last two hundred years. Okay. And so, are there a lot of Celtic influences or resonances? Oh, very much so. Yes. Yeah, we we have the same language as Irish, pretty much. We speak Gaelic. Okay. Okay. And is it still a living language? Uh, again, rather than still, uh, there is actually a Gaeltacht primary school there now. Okay. But when I was learning a little bit of Manx, it was uh, it was a very much a minority thing. We were down to the last couple of hundred people who spoke it, okay. and I'm far from fluent, a long way off. It was um... <laughs> anyway. The the language officially died back in the 1960s, so okay. it's not a real living language anymore. Okay, um, you um, you describe in the book why you moved to West Cork, but would you be able to say that? What was your prime motive, mo motive to move from Manx to West Cork or from London maybe? Where hey, I, I've been living in England for quite a while by that yeah. stage. I'd, um, I came to Ireland visiting old friends and I liked the place. Yeah. And eventually two or three visits later, I decided I'd come here and try living here. Yeah. 
30 years ago. Um, I think I might stay here now. <laughs> and yeah, you, you, have, you have grown roots, I think, and sort of integrated in the West oh, Cork community. I'd like to think so, yes. Yeah. I, my children were born here and my work is here and my music is here. And yeah, because stuff, I think. Can, you, can you tell us a little bit about your work? I'm a coach driver. Mm. So COVID was a big disaster for us. I worked in tourism. I'm yeah. also a tour guide. And um, currently I'm, I'm mainly doing school bus driving. Mm. But I mean, in, as you, apart from the musician part, which is of course also intermittent, in, especially at, in, at this time, but um, you, you, there's a whole range of things you do, you undertake or you have undertaken to earn money. Like yeah, a tree nursery. Sorry? The same as a lot of people. I have a few strings to my bow, but um, I, I wouldn't call myself a professional musician or a professional gardener or a professional anything, really. I've earned most of my money as a coach driver and as a tour guide mm -hmm. in the last 20 years. Okay. Okay. And one of the, the things that I, I found really interesting is. Um, yeah, your very practical descriptions of how you interact with your environment to um, live independently is with a group of people that are around you, with the community of Cool Mountain, which has changed over the years, obviously. <laughs> we, we, uh, we never quite agree whether it's a community or a village. It's a collection of individual people. And the time I was writing about in my book was the 90s, mm. which was... A very exciting time for me, and I suppose that's why I wrote the book. I'd like to think it was interesting to quite, quite a wide range of people. Yeah, it is. I mean, you built the house that you're now sitting in, didn't you, yourself or with other people? I had people? a lot of help from my friends. I yeah. didn't do it all by myself. I'm not a particularly practical man, but uh, yes, I did build it, yeah. <laughs> you come across as quite practical. Well, thanks. <laughs> some of the people, some of the time. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, you and I also as somebody who actually uh, learns as he as he goes along, which is, I mean, I think that's a talent in itself. In a way, it's an improvisational talent, I suppose. Isn't that right? Um, yeah. So, so yeah, I, I I enjoy a wide range of things and. Um, of life's very short, just have a lash and see how you get on. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Okay. And uh, can you tell a little bit about the process of writing the book? Um, yes. Uh, I'm not really sure how to start. I, I made a few false starts. I, okay. I uh, ended up with a lot of stuff in the waste paper basket. Good. And then... I imagined I was writing a letter to somebody okay. and it developed from that. So um, the, the subject matter is, uh, it's, I'm, I'm quite opinionated. I'm sure that came across out of the book and I wanted yes. to avoid making it sound uh, pompous or preachy. I wanted to write it in a very informal style. And so, something like a cross between writing a letter to an old friend and a, di a, a diary. And that eventually seemed to work. So that's how I started writing it. Okay, that's, that's really good. And, but you, did you write it on a computer? I did. Okay. It sounds maybe like a silly question, but you, you are quite vocal about how you, you know, how you tr actually trying to keep uh, you know, electricity away from your life in some way. Let, let, let's be clear about it. The, the time I was writing in the book was the 90s up until maybe four or five years into this century. Yeah. Um, these that, days I have electricity. Yeah, I can see <laughs> that. Quite a, a modern life. But in, in some ways, I mean, you, you don't sort of date the... the uh, I, I didn't completely realize it was all in the 1990s and the early noughties 
because also you end the book in a way with with explaining how you know the next generation your own kids and other people's kids in around how they live compared to how you lived or or how they lived as they grew up so in in some ways there's a kind of it seems to i'm not clear about where when things happened and in a way it doesn't really matter to the reader at all because what matters is that you sort of you go in to to what is happening you know you go with you you know you explain about seed saving or about you know how you how you eat how you grow vegetables what you do and it doesn't really matter when that happened it's a bit timeless it doesn't matter you're right but at the same time that period i was writing about came to an end when um firstly the the economic downturn happened and uh, everybody's life started changing and secondly a lot of new technology appeared and it, it took over really we lived in a little bubble when you could exist that way i think it would be a lot harder for people now yeah but that's interesting because that's that's one thing i started talking to you about it just before we recorded is that um in this day i mean this day and age there are quite a few people i think interested in living off grid in in a new way like in the Aran islands they have an energy community and they say they're about a year away from being self-sufficient as an island group and there is well, in, in Tipperary there's like a community energy which uh, you know generates its own energy and um for example i live close to skibbereen and there we are setting up our own um, sustainable energy community with i have to admit the idea is to get government grants to do to to set that up but it's still a, you know it's still a move in that direction in a way you were trailblazers i think and that's also why i find it interesting because um i'm in, also interested in a in a new economy like a donut economics is a is a sort of system for circular growth like zero growth not 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 crazy growth and, and 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 greed but also we're taking into account you know what we do to the rest of the planet and biodiversity and all those you know noble goals to um <laughs> and 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 in a way what you end up with is is in trying to strengthen local local economies and local communities which you know i mean ireland is importing a huge amount of stuff so we've started with the local group, we've started to talk about food security, for example. And I think okay. that is, you know, and especially in this in this era, but you know, we you saw a little bit of, of shortages with COVID, but there's every reason to believe that, that that could increase instead of the, you know, and and it and it it has to increase in a way because the way we are dealing with the planet, as you also described, is not sustainable. So um, in that sense, I, I, I really recommend your book because if people are interested in that topic, there, there's a lot to, uh, to gain for them, I think. Would you agree? Uh, I, I'm not quite sure I was um, thoroughly understanding what you were talking about there, really, the donut economics. I agree that you can't have infinite growth in a finite system. I really feel that um, capitalism is a force that is destroying human uh, communities and the biological environment, really. I find it quite easy to pin a lot of the blame on the whole consumer, the, uh, the, the capitalist constant growth thing. I'm, I'm not very good at speaking about this politically. It was more of a gut feeling. I wanted to turn my back on that kind of a world. And so did many of my friends who are now my neighbors. We collectively decided we didn't really want any part of that. Yeah, but I think that's a feeling shared so. shared by more and more people, actually, except, you know, the, well, the, the question is how it. to do it. Sorry? I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I, yeah. I, uh, I don't really know much about the people on Aran Island or in Tipperary, so I can't really comment on that. Yeah. Uh, are they no. still using mobile phones? Do they grow their own food? Have they built their own homes? Mm. Do they think they need to live with um, an economy? If you live on an island, can can they actually live 
by barter, for example. I have no idea. Hmm. Is yeah, is that is that is yeah, because the, you describe that as well, but uh, obviously it's never going to happen totally. We're never going to go go back to that stage, I think, where we totally lose the idea of money. Or do you envisage that? You're right. Um arriving into West Cork, I I wasn't trying to uh to set up some kind of an alternative political reality. I was here to enjoy my life. I was here to play music, to meet a lot of people, to um, find out what Ireland was all about and to find the bits of it I liked and to integrate. I'm happy working. I, I don't intend to overthrow capitalism or anything, but um, you know, I'd be quite lonely if I tried to. Uh, life was an awful lot of fun back in the 90s. It seemed a lot simpler then. Mm. And we found that we, we arrived in a place where it was very easy to live cheaply and to do things for yourself rather than depending on, on business to do it all for you. So even now, I, I have my own well. I'm not connected to any kind of uh, water mains or sewage or anything like that. All the practical details of life, I try and manage myself as far as it's practical. Yeah, I'm not preaching. I'm not telling other people how they should live. No, but I mean, I, I see it as an example, not as a, as as preaching. I mean, of, of course, there's a little bit of that, you know, how you think things, how you think things should be. You know, it's all, you don't want the more a escort to look like Dubai or something. What? <laughs> it, it's more a record of what actually happened. Yeah. It's a reminiscence rather than an instruction manual or a political manifesto. Of, of course, yeah, it reads well. And um, do you still feel that are you still connected as a community, or are you like most other Very people? Much so. But, okay. um, the whole nature of that changes. Yeah, some of my best friends are people I've lived here and grown here with. There's, uh, there's one man I'm thinking of, I, I see him three or four times a month, and over the years we've played music together, we've played sport together, we've worked alongside each other, and we've worked for each other, and we've been travelling together, and this has been happening over the best part of 30 years. Yeah. There are another 20 people around here I could tell a, a similar story about, so to that extent we have that, uh, we still have a very good sense of community, yes. And um, if is it open to newcomers? I mean, is it still possible to, to come to Cool Mountain and go and live there like you did? It, it's not really a case of uh, somebody declaring that it's open. I bought a bit of land mm -hmm. from the farmer who is willing to sell me a piece. Yeah. And these days I can't really, uh, I have friends who are homeless and they're asking a similar question. I, I don't know quite how how that would go for them, really. Yeah. We moved into an area where people were busy moving out. When we arrived here, many Irish people were traveling abroad to find a living for themselves. And um, what they left behind was quite empty. And we were glad to move in and live cheaply. Yeah. And, and you... Really. you you could also buy that land, I think, from the, how you describe it, because you had a kind of relationship with the farmer. You knew him, and you know. Absolutely, it was... I, I got to know him four or five years by the point I bought the land from him. Yeah. yeah. So. It's okay. not like there's a, an official community set up mm. with rules or anything. It's it's a village. Yeah. It's a collection of people who arrived at approximately the same time and took approximately the same advantages uh, out of what they found. Yeah. And we're all content to live a, a more low tech kind of a life. It wasn't a problem. It was a lot of fun. OK. And, and, and as far as low tech goes at the moment, uh, you, you described your well. And um, I mean, I mean, are people still growing their own food, for example, on the li li like you did? Or you I'm sure do. they are all over the country. I still yeah. grow mine, and most of my neighbours still do. Yeah. But we're a long way short of self-sufficiency. Okay. There's nobody I know growing um, 
any kind of cereal crops or even if we were i don't think i know anybody who could mill them so you know we have to buy things like flour and and again i must repeat this this was all back in the 90s really that the period i was writing about yeah these days i i live in a modern house and i buy quite a lot of my food from the local supermarket yeah but i do as much as i can myself and would you be able to sort of um describe what, what would need to to happen for us people living in Ireland to become self-sufficient? Oh, I have no idea. Um, I mean, you, you, you named the, the mill. Oh, the government. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. I, I'm no. not trying to tell anyone else how to live. It's simply a record of what myself okay. and several of my friends did 25 and 30 years okay. ago. Okay. And, but do you, do you feel, you know, you're not, if people wanted to ask you st st things about, oh, how did you do this or how did you do that, would you be happy to talk to them, or is it like, okay, go and look and <laughs> you, you find have to your give own me an way? Example. I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Well, I don't know. I mean, you 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 also write about your um, like mistakes you make. I mean, something about the potato fields and. Uh, you know, you, you right. learn a lot by how, if you zoom in on the details, I think a lot of it is about detail, about, you know, how into... You can learn from your errors, that's true. Um, what, what I learned from that was that um, food farming on a big scale is best done by professionals. Uh -huh. I, we were happy to try it. When you do it uh, for your family on a garden scale, it's fine. When you scale up, you have to take account of the time you're putting into it. Uh, if you're trying to do it to make money, then you have to. Your time is is worth something. Yeah. And we didn't realize that. Yeah. Uh, so we did an awful lot of work to produce the amount of potatoes that you could actually go out and buy for a very small amount of money. Yeah. But. So you it was very satisfying work, and we, we learned in lots of ways. It was yeah. grand. It, okay. was, yeah, it was a lot of fun, is the main point. Yeah, well, and I hope. Yeah. And, and, uh, I, I'm not speaking on behalf of anybody else either. I'm just, the book was all about um, trying to preserve the memory of some very exciting times. It's that okay. simple. Okay. One more question. Uh, are you still involved with trees? Uh, I still plant trees on my own lands. I still have a, a few to um to share around people, but not, not in any commercial way, no. Uh, because what that's one thing that I, I wanted to ask you, very practical. I mean, you talk about bur you know, uh, harvesting your own wood, maybe drying mm -hmm. it yourself to 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 keep your heat your stove and your heater going is that still ongoing I've, I've worked with a chainsaw for the last 25 years uh, sometimes it's jobs for local farmers at the moment uh, one of my neighbors wants a little patch of woodland he owns to be managed and i'm doing that for him and my pay is the firewood that we harvest from it okay and his benefit is that his woodland is improved and um <clears throat> excuse me it should end up being a lot better looking uh coppiced and harvested and managed well that sounds really sustainable and this one because i also have a, a wood stove uh, i'm renting a holiday bungalow and um i get uh from the drina co-op i get kiln dried hardwoods and i'm always a bit worried that i'm sort of um burning murdered trees how likely, I mean, you know, would, <laughs> whereas I'm also trying to plant trees. So that's a bit of a- Euthanasia, not murder. <laughs> I suppose the point is, if you're taking, most of the wood that I harvested was uh, damaged from storms. Yeah. So it was thinning. And uh, if ever there was a harvest, it wasn't purely for firewood, it would be for other reasons. And there would nearly always be replanting going on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had a long relationship with a, a, a big estate a few miles to the east of Dunmanway. And the man who lived there had an overview for everything that happened. 
and he managed his woodlands very well indeed. And uh, he had records going back over 200 years wow. that logged when some of his trees were actually planted. And uh, it's very satisfying work. It's okay. also quite hard work. Okay, it sounds great. Okay, Fred, thank you very much for speaking to me. And um, I look forward to many people reading your book because it, it's going to be published by uh, Sweeney and O'Donovan. <laughs> That's or right. Donovan and Sweeney yes. Publishing House. I How did you end? Sorry? I think it's it actually technically is published. The launch will be next Tuesday. Okay. The 30th. okay. And of course, I'll see you there. Okay. See you there. Thank you. Thank you, too.